everyone. Uh, so I'm Chetan Khatri. So I will be talking on no more struggle with Apache Spark workloads in, in production. So this journey has been, uh, I'm working on this project from last one and a half year. So whatever I learned in this project, this experience, I will share with you guys. So, uh, thank you for setup and projects, projector. Can I have so, oh, Okay, fine. So who am I? About me, I'm a lead of data science at Axion Labs. Uh, I have worked with um, uh, companies like Nazara Games and Excel Corporation. I did the open source contribution with Apache Spark, HBase, and Elixir language in my past. And uh, yeah, I did uh, MSc Computer Science from Kutch University. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, this is agenda. I will explain for the people who started working with Apache Spark that what are the primary, uh, primarily data structures there. And I will talk about kind of pragmatic explanation of uh, what does it mean by executor core, container state, job, and task in Spark, and how uh, understanding of this can help. And I will talk about parallel uh, read with and challenges with JDBC and how you can use bulk load. And then I will talk about how um, you can avoid unnecessary suffer with the examples. And what are the challenges you might face while working with like sorting and uh, strategy. And at the end, uh, why not to use color concurrent future explicitly. And what are the alternative options are there. So I will ask a couple of questions that how many of you are working with Apache Spark? Can you raise hand? And how many of you use Scala for Spark only? Yeah. So as everyone knows, I start with the introduction that uh, what is Apache Spark? So Apache Spark is general purpose unified data processing uh, framework. Uh, which has a uh, couple of modules like uh, Spark SQL, MLlib, GraphX, and uh, Spark Streaming, Structure Streaming. And uh, now it is getting larger ecosystem with uh, Delta Lake and Delta IO. So in general, if you want to process the data in memory, uh, Spark is the best option to process the data and do inference on top of the uh, creating ML-based modeling and distribute that workload on cluster. So the first question is, the, what, what are RDDs? So RDD is a logical um, data model, uh, which is uh, splitted across uh, different, uh, different executors in, uh, in the cluster. So technically speaking, that uh, RDD is split across uh, different uh, nodes, and you can apply your functional uh, lambda uh, function on top of each split parallelly and concurrently. And it is a resilient and immutable. That does mean if you, uh, when you have the RDD and if uh, something has failed, it has a capability to go back to the original state. And immutable means that uh, it cannot be changed. Once you create that, it will be threat safe. And that's why when you talk about uh, distributed computing, you need immutable data structure, so it is thread safe, so you can spawn so many threads and achieve the concurrency and parallelism. And uh, it does provide you compile time type shape and strongly type inference, so you can create the RDD of integer, you can create RDD of string and text, and you want to create RDD of double binary, you can create of primitive data type that you need. Uh, RDD is lazy evolution, so if you create the entire, so the when you work with um, Spark, when you create transformation action, it generates the directed acyclic graph, and the graph will get executed when you call the action. So until that, you got uh, entire uh, transformation list with the action, and uh, when you call the action something, it will get executed. So all these, uh, um, uh, any analysis er error exception that you will get, you will get at the action level. 
in terms of Spark uh, operations, it has got transformation and action. Uh, that all transformation are lazy evaluated. So you uh, you describe that, and the action will be taken when you call the any action in the operation in the Spark. So the, so the how many general purpose um, library and functions are there? Uh, if you want to compute the uh, actions and transformations, so you have got map, filter, flat map, number, uh, uh, the partition, group by, and sort by, in Spark, and then you got uh, statistical and mathematical uh, um, functions like sample and random split. If you want to use uh, machine learning, and if you are let's say computing random forest or exibost, and if you want to create the test and train set uh, uh, data, then you can do random sampling or subsampling that you want to get here. Um, in terms of set theory, you can get all this union, intersection, subtract, distinct, Cartesian, and zip. In terms of data structure and I.O., you have got repartition, colors, zip, partition, and key by, and all our action that you can see here. So the question is that when to use the RDD? Uh, you can use RDD when you don't care about the structure of data, or if you don't know structure of data. If you don't care about the all available Lambda function that provided by Scala TSL. If you don't care about schema or structure of the data, and if you don't care about optimization performance and inefficiencies that uh, which is provided by tungsten and catalyst engine, um, it is very slow compared to um, uh, for the non-JVM languages like Python and R. If you don't care about inadvertent inefficiencies uh, that I'll talk after this, uh, then you can use RDD. What I mean by inadvertent inefficiencies in RDDs, for example, in this thing, I have got RDD called past RDD, and then applying filter and saying that uh, the case class on that and saying project sprint and number of stories. I'm filtering for project is finance, and then saying map, uh, whatever key value pair you can see here, and you get a sprint and number of stories. Then I'm doing reduce by key, and, and then applying filter on the Sprint is not sprint, and uh, then I'm taking um, uh, the take of hundred and doing for each for specific uh, stories. So in this example, if you can see, uh, filter can be done before reduced by key. So it 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 provides you the performance penalty and does suffering here. Um, yeah, so if you use uh, data frame, for example, the tungsten and catalyst driver will optimize your execution model and tell you that what things go after what. But in RDD, uh, you get performance penalty of inadvertent inefficiencies. So what is data set API in Apache Spark 2.0? Um, that uh, you can get type safe uh, operation on top of the domain, which is compiled lambda functions here. So for example, I am trying to read the JSON file from Spark and then saying that I want to have a case class employee name and age uh, string and integer, then creating data set of that employee domain object and saying that employees data frame as employee. And then I can apply all the lambda function on top of this data set uh, object. And I can say p dot age is greater than three. The advantage is that uh, you know that uh, the age is integer here. You cannot say string here. But if you use the uh, Spark or SQL way of doing that, probably you get uh, uh, exception or analysis error at the runtime. So generally what happened that when you work with Spark, probably uh, you uh, you e execute your job, which takes six to seven hours, and at the end you see one error. And again, you change small thing, uh, and then again you deploy that. So probably the cost of maintenance is uh, is is greater than cost of development when you work with Spark. So if you use um, type safe uh, at the compile time, then you can avoid some of the uh, exception and errors which you get at runtime. So the, what are the structured data uh, structure available in Spark? One is a data frame and data sets, uh, with, when you have a structured that. So when to use a data set? When you want strongly type inference and when you want, when you want ability to use powerful lambda functions. 
uh, Spark SQL's optimized execution engine, Catalyst and Tungsten, can be constructed from JVM object and uh, manipulated using functional transformation like map, filter, and flat map. Uh, data frame is a data set organized into named columns, so technically it's a type alias of data set of row. So if I plot the graph that what things are at where, so if you use the Spark SQL module, you get syntax error runtime, you get analysis error runtime. For example, if you write spark.sql and put entire query, and if you see that uh, the column name uh, which you have provided, select uh, like employee ID, employee name, and uh, city, and um, let's say address, and if you read some typo over there, the error you might get, you will get runtime, and that probably in, in general in industrial cases you get after seven hours, eight hours, because you read data from Parquet and then you read uh, data from JDBC and join that and apply some transformation. And after spending six to seven hours on the job, if you see that your job has failed because of small mistake, uh, this is not, I believe, um, developer's productivity time. So if you use a data frame, uh, you get a syntax error compile time and still you get analysis error at runtime. But if you want to get analysis and syntax error at compile time, the best way to use is data set API, and uh, you can uh, create the custom objects and uh, pass that and uh, just map that with your data. So it gives you freedom and flexibility the way you want to control the data. And um, yeah, as you work with Scala, you can get other advantage. You can use any other libraries that you want to uh, embed with that. So you have the freedom of that. So as I, as I said, that data frame and data set, um, data set is alias of, uh, sorry, data frame is the alias of data set of row. And this is available from 2016 in um, Spark. So you got um, typed API and untyped API. So same thing if, if you want to achieve with the data frame API code, the how you can do it. For example, if you say passed RDD to data frame, so you are converting RDD to data frame, and then you're saying filter project is finance and saying group by by, by each sprint and saying aggregation, calculate number of stories, and then you are saying limit and giving so. So here, limit of 100 will not add advantage, but if you are using limit while reading the data from JDBC, it can push down the predicate and only get the 100 uh, those that you need. If you want to do same business functionality and logic if you uh, with the SQL view and SQL query, you can have Spark or SQL and say the query like same way which I told. But in this case, you if if you type uh, let's say uh, your table audits to only audit, that error you will get runtime when this code get executed at some point of time in your entire Spark job. And uh, if you want to do with uh, RDD way with the Scala, you can create the case with department age, and then you can say uh, department uh, age of one, and then you can reduce by key and provide this um, uh, value and do the uh, this combination, and then apply the map and say age divided by the um, uh, value, which will give you department by size. So. Um, let's talk about Catalyst and Sparks. So uh, in, in the execution Spark model, you get uh, SQL, AST, data frame, and data sets. Uh, it generates a resolved uh, logical plan. From that, it chooses the best logical plan. It will do cost-based optimized model and figure it out physical plan. And then it will choose the physical plan, which is statistically less uh, execution time and it will generate the RDD. The RDD which you can see at the end, this is not the same RDD which I was talking about earlier. Anyway, as I said, that RDD is the primary data abstraction, uh, data structure in Spark, so at the end, everything will get converted to RDD. But l last RDD which you can see is a highly optimized uh, JVM bytecode which runs on uh, JVM at the end because Spark runs on JVM. 
So in terms of example, you don't need to worry that, uh, let's say if you, if you use a data frame and data set that um, if you do, if you read from file, let's say parquet events and read the employee table and then do join and then apply the filter. In physical plan, it, it, it does scan first employees uh, uh, and then filter it and then join it. And in physical plan with predicate push down and column pruning, you get uh, always optimized scan and optimized uh, read from table and the file and it does join for you. This old chart that um, which data structure is faster and compared to Python and Scala and R. So if you use the data set and RDD in terms of memory usage, when you case it, uh, it takes uh, less um, um, casing time. And in terms of serialization and deserialization performance, it uses by default encoders, then using a cryo and Java serialization. So this was a brief about uh, if anyone start to work with uh, Spark, what are the things that you should know? And then um, in general, you should not, I mean, you will not, not, not be writing only one job on the cluster. What we'll have in practical scenario that you will get one job, uh, Spark jobs in a workflow schedule or uh, with a dependent behavior with, for example, Airflow, and then you will trigger that. So you want to utilize the entire uh, cluster. You want to take maximum advantage of resources and you have to make sure that you are not uh, killing the infrastructure by uh, over allocation of resources to your specific job because if one job takes uh, less time and other jobs takes a longer time at the end, um, entire workflow is not optimized, right? Because you, 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 your goal is to make sure that entire workflow of ETL, uh, for example, completes on optimized uh, way and uh, uh, performance uh, based approach. So for that to understand, uh, you need to know a couple of um, approaches like uh, executors, core, container, stage, job, and task. For this example, I'm taking Yarn as a resource manager. So how you can change the configuration and tuning so you can run maximum jobs. Uh, understand Yarn as a kind of virtual uh, orchestration tool. And uh, each Spark job will become one container and the resources that you allocate from the yarn uh, will uh, have the importance over there because uh, if there are no more resources, you ca your Spark job will be in accepted mode and you won't be able to run that. So internal terminology of Spark, uh, job is, uh, I mean, entire Spark job, you provide transformation and action. So each uh, transformation action mapping in Spark would create a separate job, uh, which you can see on a Spark UI. And the stage is a set of tasks in each job which can run parallel uh, using the thread pull executor library in Spark. And task is, again, lowest level of concurrent and parallel execution unit. And primarily, a task uh, object name is used in so many other libraries like Geo and Cats, um, sorry, Monix and those libraries. So this is also task, which runs concurrent and parallel execution unit. And how you can compute the, uh, calculate the uh, number of tasks is stage into number of partition in, the in, in that specific stage. So each stage is split into number of partition, uh, which is available by default, let's say it's 200. And then if you want to expand the number of partition, you will use the repartition. And if you want to reduce the number of partition, you will use the call as. So, uh, the the fundamental uh, truth is that, that if you want to boost the parallelism, you will have to increase the n number of partition and then apply the uh, computation on top of that. So this is an example of uh, jobs, which you can see here. Uh, you can use Spark UI and click on a stage. So why is important? Because you need to understand that which code block is taking how long time. So you, you can focus on specific code block and optimize that. So also you can understand the stage has got allocated to which executor and how many executors have been added here. You can also see the um, specific task, I mean task is block or success or dead or failed. 
by looking at the task level and understand that, uh, let's say, if you got five transformation action in a one Spark job, generally it happens. And then you want to see that which transformation is taking how long time. Instead of checking only entire job is taking how long time, you can uh, dig into this Spark UI and understand that w w what is taking how long time. So also, it, it does make sense to understand this configuration uh, available at the YARN. The YARN scheduler and then uh, minimum uh, allocation virtual core and uh, maximum allocation virtual cores and uh, minimum allocation memory and maximum allocation memory. So it does mean that when you, s when you submit your Spark job, you provide a uh, um, number of executors and uh, number of core over there. So uh, if, if you provide that uh, memory and executors, um, the core that uh, each job can take maximum here is six. And uh, memory that you can provide maximum is 28,832 MB. So uh, what happened that specific, uh, like when you work with the entire data team, so there's no one developer is submitting one job with the high resources and other people are just waiting for a cluster because one job is running for a long time. So you can control that behavior because you know basically that your, all the jobs can come in this limit. And uh, uh, YARN node manager resource memory MB, uh, you can set here. And how you can decide that at a time, how many Spark job can run with the, this equation that yarn dot node manager dot resource dot memory MB, 54,000, and divide by the maximum allocation memory that you set in line number three. Um, so you can see the 13 containers that you can run uh, at a time. If you can see in total memory is 216 GB. And uh, if you want to change that uh, to the, probably I'm using the Hortonworks uh, distribution. If you want to change that to above from the default value, you can change that. Uh, if you want to see that number of CPU in, in each node, uh, you can just figure it out that how many cores are available on your uh, each CPU. And if you, I mean, it's, it's advisable to tune accordingly your workflow and Spark jobs and also the uh, yarn. So right now it is um, maximum allocation virtual cores are six. You can set to eight, for example, and then um, and then also you can set this memory uh, up and bound, upper bound, lower bound. Uh, if you can see here in this example is 216 GB, and uh, if you submit your job, uh, which which goes above that configuration, it will tell you that. You have requested virtual cores um, more than maximum configured virtual core. It will tell you the requested virtual cores are eight, and maximum virtual cores you have set up six. So they won't be able to even submit the job and hook up entire cluster. Um, this is important to understand sometimes. So what happened that you run your Spark job, which is a lazily evaluated execution model, but in some scenario, probably you can think that you can use eager execution model together. And if you want to switch both execution model at runtime, uh, you have to change the Spark scheduler before to fail and then turn it off and on on the runtime. Uh, let me give you an example that if you have got, um, uh, let's say, 12 jobs running on cluster and uh, the configuration you got two master nodes and others are worker nodes on that. When you are joining that, your all executors are getting memory full, all resources are full, but your master node, driver node has still some memory. And if you think that if you want to use those local threads and allocate some computation of, to that and uh, utilize that time, you can do that. So I'll talk about one case study. So that this project was written in SQL, and that lines of SQL in one file was 25,000 lines. So one ETL um, project written in SQL file, and th they were triggering with CSARP. So they read each and every SQL statement and trigger that as a SQL. And probably commonly they hit database again and again, because that is everything was written in SQL. 
So while converting that to Spark, Scala, and Airflow-based highly scalable non-blocking um, platform uh, implementation, the experience and exposure which I got, I'll talk about that, that what we did with that. So in terms of technology stake, uh, uh, we had uh, Scala and Python because uh, Airflow works in Python. And data access library is Scoop, Spark SQL, Spark Core, orchestration with uh, Airflow and cluster management YARN, storage, um, HDFS, Parquet, and Horton Workforce distribution. So uh, this was enterprise um, customer where we get uh, data in their in online transaction processing, and on top of this, they run the transaction system. So you can't connect with this. If you connect with this, their product will be down. So there is a log shipping, which get all the data in shadow data source, and from there um, uh, we read uh, uh, with the Spark and Scoop and do um, uh, processing and get. Uh, um, commonly used table in Park in HDFS because uh, the query will be again touching same tables and same things again and again. You see that probably as per my analysis, we saw that some of the tables were um, connected and called like 25 times and 52 times, kind of that. So those common master tables we have we have crunched together and put in Parquet. And, uh, and then you run your all business transformation on top of the parquet, so this becomes non-blocking. Also, I mean, this all concept like deadlock we encountered here because that when this is a MS SQL Server 2016, so when you read from that, it tells you deadlock because two jobs cannot read. Uh, you need to do table lock and then read the all data. And uh, also at database engine side, you can see number of connections are uh, page IO and uh, some other exception that you can see in SQL Server by using the tool like IDERA, and it tells you the number of connections, which query is taking how long time. So I mean, you can tune the performance at Spark and Scala level, but if you have the systems which, which itself take so long time to give you data, uh, technically you need to either tune that because if you open 10 connections and uh, one connection is active at the database engine side and uh, nine connections are just lying behind, what you can do for that? So this is Airflow uh, orchestration, which I'm talking about, um, uh, which jobs are running here. Um, so all commonly faced jobs are sub here. And uh, other jobs are uh, Spark submit operator here. So the goal is that to run um, some of the jobs parallelly at some point of time. So uh, you utilize the entire cluster and uh, get. Uh, so for example, if I allocate all resources to invoice line item, uh, you can't get invoice aggregation completed at the same time. So if I give like 12 GB and 12 GB and give 4, 4 GB to this thing, invoice aggregation, that specific job will run faster, but I will get again performance penalty for this job. So my goal is to complete the entire workflow. Workflow is not a specific job. So for that, you need to uh, configure some of the tuning parameter, which I discussed earlier. Also, um, it's not on, I, I mean, specifically, I believe that uh, uh, when you work with data and Spark, it's, uh, uh, art than science, uh, that some of the things comes with the experience. And for example, in this case, I wanted to uh, compute um, aggregation of uh, data frame two, which depends on aggregation of data frame one. So technically, it will be easy that you join this both skewed data here, and then say that if this column is greater than zero, then take from this value, otherwise take from this. But if you want to avoid this join entirely, probably you can you can combine entire expression because um, actually what happened that this uh, the percentage of people are working in Spark and ETL coming from the background of Java, so they they, they don't understand that probably everything is expression in Scala and you can combine that ex expression as a value. So uh, if you see entire business logic from line number here to there was added in expression and said the value of entire expression is greater than zero, then take this uh, column, otherwise takes, uh, again, otherwise you can put the when condition and get the value here. So here I'm technically avoiding the um, join here because um, the 
entire business logic of the join condition I'm putting in, in when condition which gives me value and otherwise also I'm putting nested when and saying otherwise of otherwise so uh, this was uh, help I mean this helped me to avoid the join and get the value in the same data frame so I mean technically this has avoided the uh, entire suffer of uh, transitional uh, uh, data and tables and since I thought it was 25,000 of SQL lines it was joining 152 tables together and probably it is joke because how can you join 152 tables why can't you change the architecture of that but I mean the goal is to replace the ETL uh, platform not the business logic because the um, their uh, transition schema structure would be like that also if you see the architecture the I mean this data mart customer specific reporting DB the structure of that uh, entire schema would be same because that is again plugged with SAP BO or IBM Cognos or whatnot so you can't change that the only freedom which you have is the chain the black box which is in between which you can see here and provide the performance So how we identified, because as you know that with join you have to use broadcast or sort merge join and uh, yeah, so by default uh, uh, join type is sort merge and if you want to uh, other is broadcast. So when, when join happen, you, you are saying the specific data frame copy to all the executor nodes. Uh, so the shuffle will be reduced and because it, if the size is sm small, either one, right? A and B, either one has a small size, one one can be copied, so you avoid the shuffle. And so, what we what we did is is compute the size of data frame with the function, and then also understand the number of records in specific data frame, and based on that, dynamically tell that uh, which type of join is needed because. Um, a specific job is fine, but this this platform, this tool runs for all the customers of customer, let's say, right? If customer has got 152 customers, you don't know that which which specific customer ID has got how much data. And you can't uh, technically, it is, it, is, it is cumbersome to write the code which is specific to specific customer. Then you need to do code maintenance and this and that. So as much as possible, dynamically, um, um, joint type was identified here. So also um, one thing that I, I have seen that people doesn't understand that uh, when trying to read from JDBC uh, what you should do. For example in uh, my practice that um, when you try to read data from table in JDBC you say spark.read.jdbc and provide table name and uh, connection property what happens when you run this code and um, what would be impact at database engine side so not many people uh, take a look at the database engine or other source of data and see the uh, status and um, health of that uh, system that was happening when you were connecting with spark to that so when i saw that um, uh, in this database engine side that how much cpu time is taking and total, uh, total elapsed time I can see only three requests for that with the query which query is taking how long time and uh, this is for example query and gives me time for execution but because uh, that was creating only one connection and if you want to paralyze that uh, get max I mean get the more number of connection and then you pull the data from JDBC uh, you need to tell number of parties on here and if you see number of partition here is not equal to the number of partition which I was talking in, in data frame or RDD this number of partition is equal to number of connection that you establish with the uh, JDBC and you provide um, um, column name which is primary key uh, probably that would be index in the table and uh, lower bound and upper bound so you provide maximum and upper limit and tell to split it across the uh, number of connections so if you say the number of rows are let's say one to hundred that split by five so a five connection will pull 20 20 records together parallelly and <laughs> i don't see this was explicitly written in spark documentation that you can uh, pull parallelly from this way 
So what we did is that we have what we did is that we have created one uh, util function and that has uh, um, that provides you minimum and maximum column value for either query or from the table and gives you list so you can use that list in that uh, function. Yeah, this provides you for um, this provides you for table and this one was for query. Uh, so you can use this function here, employee table split and provide head and head and tail to the lower bound and upper bound. So after that, you can see the number of connection got increased in the table in the table read. So earlier, for example, it was only one connection. Now you can see that probably ten connection. Uh, we try to read parallelly and tells you CPU time also. So the, whatever I said was about uh, tuning the read part in Spark. Now I'll talk about tuning the write part. So uh, generally, JDBC write data row by row by default in Spark. If you want to write data in bulk, in, in, in a batch, you need to use a library provided by any source library. Like for example, in this, I was using MS SQL server. So for that, there's a library called bulk load. Uh, you can provide here the bulk copy batch size, that how many records you want to stream it to the table directly. And as I said, it is not NoSQL, so you need to do table lock. I mean, we all talk about NoSQL, HBase, Cassandra, and all these fancy things, but in in reality, so many people still work with I mean, with the customer where the data is in RDBMS, right? And uh, mostly we pull data from that. So you need to do table lock, true. And then this configuration help you very high uh, to write the bulk load to the table. Uh, the library is linked in GitHub here. So in terms of optimizing strategy, how you can understand the uh, join types. Uh, so when you got data frame, you can get the value that how much auto broadcast join threshold is set. Uh, by default is 10 MB. Uh, if the size is 10 MB, by default it will do. Uh, if you want to understand the execution query model, you can do this query execution dot logical dot number tree string. It will provide you which task is running after what. So you understand that how your business functionality has been triggered. Uh, you can also do data frame dot explain. Um, so as I said, that if you want to boost the uh, parallelism and concurrency, you need to increase the number of partition because that's where the game is there. Um, so if you want to uh, increase the and so the question is that when to increase and when to decrease. So for example, the number of connection was triggered on data frame at the right time was based on number of partition in the d data frame. So if you, if you know that if you are creating, for example, uh, 28 connections, then your database is getting um, crashed or it is getting hanged or whatever is happening, there's impact on database engine. So if you want to control that, you need to reduce the number of partition at the data frame, which you can do by employeedf.colas of 10. So it will decrease the number of partitions, and then you can do bulk load to the um, table. Uh, if, if you want to increase that um, partitions, uh, you can use uh, uh, repartition and increase that. Um, I mean, this all can help you to reduce the impact on network uh, communication, file I/O, bandwidth I/O. Uh, as I said, that uh, if you want to disable broadcast join, if you think that it's taking by default, which which you don't want, you can set to auto broadcast join threshold minus one, and uh, order of join doesn't matter. Sometimes we think that right hand side is smaller always. It's not necessary that uh, you, you there's no need to um, uh, keep the order same. If if you want to broadcast forcefully, you can uh, tell explicitly. Um, so technically, if you minimize suffering and boost parallelism and uh, partitioning, bucketing, call as the partition and hash partitioner. Hash partitioner will provide you splitting based on the range which you provide to the data frame. Um, I mean, this all technique it then help you to control number of partition and execution model. 
You can go to Spark UI and see that how much is data exchange is happening. Exchange is shuffling here. So you can see in this example, 98 MB. Fine. Sometimes you can say 6.7 GB. So probably I don't have to do shuffling again and again. I should persist that and then avoid shuffling. Here you can see 44 G, uh, GB of shuffling happening on each transformation because, as I said, it was longer job in a one spark job. So I mean, try and uh, understand from the Spark UI will tell you that uh, how much shuffling is happening and how much time is taking. Uh, some of the challenges that uh, I faced uh, with this is um, working with sort. So the, to match the behavior of SQL uh, in, in, in the SQL engine and the Spark is different technically because the way it does sort, the way it takes distinct, the way it takes um, uh, round function, uh, everything is not same because uh, the behavior of, for example, round function with SQL is based, uh, Spark SQL is based on specific standard, but the other RDBMS behaves differently. So, for example, if I wanted to sort the strings value by default sort, which you can see in the line number 168 to 172, was not working because um, after that you again do some uh, transformation and things that it doesn't possess the same order of the data. So, I mean, for that I need to create the UDF, uh, which uh, takes a string sequence of string and does sort by uh, and then does the um, create the string by comma, and then apply same thing on the aggregation that I achieve here. <coughs> also, uh, some of the people have uh, also experienced that drop duplicate is not consistent because um, drop duplicate is not consistent because of the number of partition in the data frame. Uh, if you got let's say 120 partition and do drop duplicate, uh, and then again try to print that, you, you, you won't see that uh, the consistent behavior each time. Um, the o if you want to do in the same way, you can do coalesce of one, then it, it has only one partition, and then do drop duplicate, so it will give you same behavior. Um, but if you reduce the number of partition, then again you get performance penalty, because you can't do parallelism and uh, concurrency. So what we did is that, the uh, I mean, there's other way uh, 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 apart from this. In this approach, use a window and partition by and do order by, um, and then uh, get row number over specific all the rows and uh, take first one and drop that column out. So you will uh, still consist the order of the rows. The other way is that you repartition that data frame and take first first value and then do reduce by key on top of that. So one scenario where, I mean, uh, one year back, I thought to use uh, future uh, in Scala because what is happening that I have some reading data from some table and uh, parquet and doing some tr uh, heavy lifting Spark transformation, five, six reads and transform and load, again doing for different entity and then um, going with this. So when you apply the Exxon, Exxon in Spark is sequential, you can't do um, uh, parallelly action. So, uh, so in this way, uh, if, if if I want to execute eagerly on the same time, so future will kick execution at the point of time when you trigger that. So I'm saying that combining, um, composing all this uh, code lines statement in one function and saying return the future and execute both of these together, and then zipping both together and saying await time. Uh, and then triggering both of this together. Actually, future code will run on driver node in Spark. It, it won't uh, distribute to executor. So as I said earlier, that if you get uh, um, memory available in master node, uh, technically, and your worker nodes are full, you can take advantage of master node in driver and uh, spawn up the future here. But then we, we faced the problem because some of the, my team members started uh, refactoring code and put that code in some common uh, place and run that. And as you know, the future is not referential transparent. What happened, they started to give us different behavior each time and we don't know what, why data is coming different every time. So at that time, we started to use uh, Monix, which is IO Monarch. And uh, the advantage is that 
that we uh, you can change the behavior to ex uh, eager execution model to lazy execution model by setting the um, uh, fair from scheduler spark scheduler at runtime by spark.conf.set uh, scheduler model to fair from FIFO for that e execution time and after that you change this uh, we were able to do this so I can give you one example which I have from uh, so in this example if you can see that I'm creating the whatever I'm returning is a task of data frame here and saying task.eval so it will execute um, uh, asynchronously and at a time and then uh, I'm setting the compute average which I want to compute uh, on different execution model eagerly and changing that pull to null so every time I uh, do compute average I, I need to pass the data frame and say that fair or FIFO uh, and this function will take accordingly and then you compose that to for comprehension and return that and you can say that that entire object which which is again returning the task Concurrently, you can say run asynchronously base. So, in this, you get freedom whether you want to run lazily or eagerly, uh, then future. And this is a uh, reference transparent. Yeah, questions? Thank you, and th th thank you for France Scala community inviting me. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very really interesting. Uh, I have a uh, couple of questions to please. Yeah. Um, and the uh, slide that you have the architecture. Uh, you spoke uh, earlier that you that Delta Lake from. Um, yeah. Can, can we replace uh, Parquet and HDFS with Delta Lake here? Yeah, we can replace Parquet and HDFS with Delta Lake. The but question is that does Delta Lake support Spark 2.4? Okay. And we were in production with Spark 2.3. Uh, so either I need to configure manually entire cluster and code base, which is risk on me. Okay. And also at that point of time, it was in maintenance mode, which we cannot go. But we can only use Delta Lake if you have the uh, ST transaction. So the, the uh, advantage of using Delta Lake is that if you want to update any row in Parquet, if you want to delete any row in Parquet. So okay. I, if you are trying to do CDC, change data capture, right? Uh, right now we do bulk load and get everything historical load data. But in future, the plan is if I want to do only read the data which got changed in transitional schema by using CT or CDC, Okay, I understand the only primary keys which got deleted, updated, and uh, inserted, then only insert that specific uh, data to the delta lake, then I can use that. Okay. Or in future, if, if I need the version controlling of the data, like if, if I see the this is first row after this code updated to this row, this row like that, then I will use the de delta.io. Okay. Um, uh, for the resource manager, can, can did you have any um, advices for Kubernetes as a, a runner? Yeah, so um, we actually tried Kubernetes with open so of OpenShift, right? But the plan is to upgrade this to the Kubernetes, obviously. Um, but um, my advice is that, yeah, you can use the Docker and then only get uh, those library which is you actually need it and actually tune the execution model and time. Yeah, same configuration is same applies over there, and this uh, Spark based uh, optimization is still works and applies there. So the o only thing is that uh, uh, since Spark has got um, side impacted unsafe libraries, uh, you need to use functional effects like Geo, uh, and that can help you to control the behavior of Spark. No. no no beam and no fling here because this is what I tried. <laughs> but I, I can talk to offline, okay, what is my experience with beam probably? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>